I am Prof. Sanjeev Padumadasan of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, University of Kalaniya, Sri Lanka. Today, I will take you through postpartum hemorrhage, a condition that is associated with considerable maternal morbidity and mortality. Adoption of appropriate preventive measures for women with risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage, as well as anticipation, early detection and appropriate management of bleeding following childbirth are important. Physiological adaptations such as an increased blood volume, increased efficiency of clotting and impaired fibrinolysis disease allow for some degree of leeway. But the pregnant woman is at considerable risk of life-threatening hemorrhage due to the increased blood flow to the uterus, which is around 10% of the cardiac output at term. Traditionally, primary postpartum hemorrhage has been defined as bleeding from the genital tract in excess of 500 milliliters within 24 hours of delivery. A blood loss of 1000 milliliters or more is defined as severe primary postpartum hemorrhage and one that is in excess of 2000 milliliters is considered very severe. For women who are either small or are already anemic, these cutoffs are too high. Furthermore, blood loss is notoriously underestimated. Secondary postpartum hemorrhage, which occurs from 24 hours following delivery up to 6 weeks postpartum, is mainly due to endometritis and retained placental tissue. And although blood loss can be severe in some cases, usually is not a cause of life-threatening hemorrhage. In the management of primary postpartum hemorrhage, a quick assessment of the woman is of utmost importance. This will determine the degree of resuscitation required. Assessment includes the estimated amount of blood lost, pulse rate and volume, blood pressure, and respiratory rate. But by the time there are abnormalities in the vital parameters, the woman would have lost a considerable amount of blood, at least one-third of a total blood volume. Massive bleeding is easily recognized. However, one must be vigilant about trickling of blood over a period of time, which might easily go unrecognized and may lead to a considerable amount of blood loss. If there are abnormalities in the vital parameters, but no significant bleeding evident, then the cause could be a hematoma such as a large broad ligament hematoma, bleeding into the abdominal cavity such as in uterine rupture, bleeding of non genital tract origin such as rupture of liver or spleen or a non hemorrhagic cause of postpartum collapse such as first or second degree uterine inversion, amniotic fluid embolism, pulmonary embolism, etc. The main mechanism of prevention of blood loss following delivery is contraction of the uterus. An uterine atony is the commonest cause of PPH, accounting for nearly 90% of cases. Although risk factors for uterine atony are clearly identified, the majority of cases occur in women with no risk factors. Therefore, all personnel attending births should be able to identify bleeding early and take appropriate initial measures to control bleeding. A uterus that is not traumatized is unlikely to bleed provided that it contracts well following delivery. Sometimes, even in cases of DIC, there may be bleeding from all over the body but not the uterus. Assessment should include the consistency of the uterus and the level of the fundus. A well contracted uterus will be firm with the fundus at or below the level of the umbilicus. Two other important facts are whether the placenta has already been delivered and if so, whether it is complete and whether the bleeding started at the time of delivery or immediately afterwards. If the placenta has not been delivered or if it is incomplete, then manual removal of placenta should be performed because as long as uterus is not empty, it will not contract effectively. However, 
If there is suspicion of placenta acute spectrum disorder, one should not remove the placenta as this can lead to catastrophic bleeding. Immediately following delivery, the placenta is still attached to the uterine wall. As long as the placenta is attached to the uterus, it is unlikely to bleed. If the bleeding started at or immediately after delivery, genital tract trauma is highly likely. If the placenta has been delivered and the uterus is firm and the fundus is at or below the level of the umbilicus, the genital tract should be explored early during the management. Weighing of drapes, pads and soaps before and after use and collection of blood into a plastic drape placed under the woman's buttocks are more accurate methods of determining blood loss. However, these methods are not freely available and bleeding may be unanticipated. Therefore, visual estimation, although unreliable, is the quickest and the most practical method of assessing the amount of blood loss. A urinary catheter should be inserted. An empty bladder makes it easier for the uterus to contract. Further, this allows accurate assessment of urine output. A staff member should be designated for maintaining of records of events. Less severe cases of postpartum hemorrhage due to uterine atony can be managed with fundal massage and the administration of 0.5 mg of ergometrine intravenously. When performing fundal massage, the fundus should be gently massaged with left hand with the aim of initiating contractions from within the uterus itself. The fundus should not be massaged vigorously because it can be counterproductive. It is important to remove any blood clots from the lower part of the uterus and the cervix because the uterus will not contract effectively if its cavity is not empty. Ergometrin causes sustained contractions of the uterus. Although ergometrin is usually contraindicated in women with increased blood pressure and heart disease, even in these women, if the blood pressure drops due to bleeding, there is no better drug than ergometrin in causing effective uterine contractions and curtailing blood loss. Syntometrin, the combination of oxytocin and ergometrin, provides the benefit of short-acting oxytocin and more sustained neutrotonic effect of ergometrin and can be used in the initial management of uterine atony. The vasodilatory effect of oxytocin balances out the vasoconstrictory effect of ergometrin. If there is no response to either ergometrin or syntometrin within 5 minutes, then misoprostol 800 micrograms can be used either rectally or sublingually or carboprost may be administered at doses of 0.25 mg either intramyometrally or intramuscularly every 15 minutes. If there is no response after 3 doses of carboprost, then it is advisable to move to the second line of management which involves the uterine balloon tamponade or a surgical measure such as the application of uterine compression sutures, uterine devascularization or even hysterectomy. In PPH, although a rational management plan is presented in this video, measures to control bleeding appropriate to the clinical circumstances should be adopted in no particular order. Although intravenous oxytocin is a drug of choice for prophylaxis of PPH, it is not usually effective in the initial management if PPH were to occur and the woman would already have had it administered as part of active management of third stage. Furthermore, oxytocin receptors may have been downregulated as a result of induction or augmentation of labor. However, an infusion with 40 units of oxytocin should be used to maintain uterine contractions following the administration of ergometry. The antifibrinolytic agent tranosamic acid is effective in the management of PPH due to any cause. But for it to be effective, it needs to be administered early at a dose of 1 gram IV slowly over 10 minutes. If bleeding is not controlled following fundal massage and medical management, and provided that genital tract trauma and retained placental parts are excluded, it is a case of 
refractory uterine atony. Then uterine balloon tamponade using either a buckle balloon or a locally devised condom catheter is a manual that can easily be performed in the labor room. It works on the principle of applying direct pressure on the bleeding uteroplacental vessels. Verbal consent should be obtained and the woman should be placed in disatomy position. The perineal region is cleaned and draped. A seam speculum is inserted. One should hold the anterior lip of the cervix with a sponge forceps and using another sponge forceps, the buckle balloon should be inserted into the uterine cavity. Then it should be filled with normal saline until adequate compression on the bleeding vessels is confirmed by the cessation of bleeding through the cervix and the drainage channel of the balloon. About 250 to 350 milliliters and sometimes even up to 500 milliliters of fluid may be necessary. Finally, the vagina should be packed with moistened gauze to prevent displacement of the balloon. Fill in the buckle balloon with warmed normal saline will prevent hypothermia. After inserting a buckle balloon or a condom catheter into the uterus, prophylactic broad spectrum antibiotics should be administered and an oxytocin infusion should be commenced to maintain contractions of the uterus. As the bleeding can go undetected as a result of the vaginal pack, the level of the fundus of the uterus should be marked on the abdomen. and the woman should be observed for vital parameters and the level of the fundus. The tamponade system is removed after about 24 hours. If uterine balloon tamponade does not work, then one should move to surgical measures, which include uterine compression sutures, uterine devascularization with either uterine artery ligation or internal iliac artery ligation or even hysterectomy. Let us now look at a case of very severe PPH. Early involvement of experienced personnel is key to a successful outcome. This includes the most experienced obstetrician, obstetric anesthesiologist and transfusion specialist. Additional personnel, nursing, midwifery and other supporting staff should be summoned. Resuscitation, identification and treatment of the cause should take place simultaneously. The most effective mode of resuscitation is treating the cause so that further blood loss is prevented. The woman should be positioned flat and oxygen should be administered via face mask at 10 to 15 liters per minute. Two large bore intravenous cannulae, 14 or 16 gauge, should be inserted. Blood should be taken for full blood count, grouping and cross matching of at least 6 units of packed cells. Coagulation profile which includes prothrombin time INR, activated partial thromboplastin time and fibrinogen levels, blood urea, serum electrolytes, renal and liver function tests and blood sugar. In the initial stages, it is vital that hypotension which could lead to multi-organ damage is avoided. Therefore, 2 liters of crystalloids such as normal saline should be infused rapidly. The first within 20 minutes and the second within 30 minutes. Although it is reasonable to use hydroxyethyl starch, dextran, which has antiplatelet and antithrombotic effects, should not be used. Lost blood is best replaced by blood, and in life threatening cases of postpartum hemorrhage, group specific blood preferably, or O negative blood may have to be administered until cross match blood is available. Hemoglobin and paxil volume can misleadingly be normal in the initial stages, and therefore, the infusion of fluid should be guided by a combination of clinical picture and laboratory results. 
Fibrin degradation products and D-dimer levels should be performed if DIC is suspected. As PTINR and APTT are reduced to the lower end of normal range and fibrinogen levels are increased during pregnancy, it is important to note that considerable amount of blood may have been lost before changes are evident in these tests. If facilities are available, transfusion of blood and blood products should be guided by rotational thrombulosimetry and the massive transfusion protocol should be adopted. If these are not available, a practical guide is fresh frozen plasma in a 1 to 1 ratio with packed red cells, cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrates if the fibrinogen level is less than 2 grams per liter, and platelets if the platelet count is less than 50 into 10 to the power 9 per liter. It is mandatory that hypothermia is avoided. Therefore, wet and blood stained clothes should be removed, forced air warming device used, and warm blood products should be transfused. By manual compression of the uterus is a manual that can be utilized temporarily to control massive bleeding, for example, during transfer to the operating theater. This is done by placing the operator's fist in the anterior phonix and pushing it upwards while pushing down on the posterior fundal part of the uterus with the other hand on the abdomen. This leads to compression of the bleeding uteroplacental vessels and stretching of the uterine arteries and can be temporarily effective in severe cases. If biomineral compression of the uterus is effective in reducing blood loss, this would mean that compression sutures which achieve compression of the uterine walls may be effective. Aortic compression is another method that can be utilized temporarily to curtail massive blood loss. The postpartum abdominal wall is distended with little muscular resistance and the manual can easily be performed on a drowsy or anesthetized patient. One must feel for the femoral pulse. The operator's fist should be placed on the umbilicus with the forearm perpendicular to the skin. The fist should be lowered in order to feel the aortic pulsations and then should be lowered further until it reaches the vertebral column. The aorta is then compressed between the bones of the operator's hand and the vertebral column of the woman. Effective compression of the aorta is confirmed by the absence of femoral pulsations. Before insertion of compression sutures on the uterus, the uterus should be exteriorized and should be compressed between the operator's hands. If the bleeding stops, it is likely that compression sutures will be effective. Application of the bleed-in suture requires an incision on the uterus. Therefore, this is ideal for bleed-in due to refractory uterine atony at cesarean delivery. A number one absorbable suture is passed over the anterior and posterior surfaces of the uterus using a large round body or a long straight needle, starting at a point 3 cm below the incision 4 cm from the lateral wall. Exit at a similar point above the uterine incision. Then loop the suture over the fundus to the back of the uterus. Pass the suture again into the uterine cavity at a point corresponding to the previous exit point on the front of the uterus. Pass the suture horizontally within the uterine cavity and exit at a similar point as the entry point on the posterior surface of the uterus. Loop the suture over the fundus again to the anterior surface of the uterus. Now pass and exit at corresponding points on the anterior surface of the uterus. Now both free ends of the suture are on the anterior surface of the uterus below the uterine incision. While the assistant manually compresses the uterus, the sutures should be progressively tightened but excessive tension on the sutures should be avoided because this can lead to ischemia of the uterine walls and increase the risk of uterine rupture in subsequent pregnancies. Once adequate tension on the sutures has been achieved, the free ends should be tied together. Finally, the uterine incision should be closed. When the uterine cavity is not open, vertical or horizontal compression sutures can be used. Vertical compression sutures. When applying vertical sutures, two to four sutures depending on the width of the uterus are passed from the front to the back of the uterus just above the bladder reflection. 
and while an assistant compresses the uterus, these are progressively tightened and tight. The sutures should be tied together at the fundus in order to prevent these from sliding down off the sides of the uterus. A couple of horizontal compression sutures can be inserted just above the reflection of the bladder. In square compression sutures, four to five sutures can be applied in the configuration of a square using a long straight needle to compress the uterine walls. These can be used to control localized bleeding due to placenta previa or placenta accreta spectrum disorder. It is important to leave some space between the sutures to allow free drainage of lochia. A disadvantage of this method is that sometimes there can be troublesome bleeding due to the multiple punch sites on the uterus, which will come up to about 16 to 20 in total. Coming to uterine devascularization, for uterine artery ligation to be effective, both the uterine arteries and the utero ovarian anastomosis should be ligated. Internal iliac artery ligation is a life-saving procedure that can be used to control severe bleeding from the pelvis, especially in resource-poor settings, provided that the skill is available. This is preferred over pelvic arterial embolization, which requires pre-planning, time, expertise, and sophisticated equipment. In intractable cases of PPH, even a hysterectomy may have to be performed as a last resort. Although uterus preserving measures can be effective in most instances of PPH, the urgency of the situation may demand hysterectomy. For example, in uterine rupture, present acute spectrum disorder with bleeding. It is a decision that has to be taken early by an experienced obstetrician before the woman deteriorates into an irreversible state.